Well, I have something here that I thought I should read tonight to you. It's a little piece written by a regular customer at the Vinyl Cafe, the record store. His name's Dwayne Carruthers. And it's, this is not something that we habitually do on the show, read something that someone else has written. But I thought I'd read this today's show because Dwayne, well, Dwayne grew up in Vancouver. He used to work at the Magpie on Commercial Drive. He's a big, big chap, big bone guy, black frame glasses, wears a brown windbreaker that says Carl on the chest. <laughs> Dwayne buys all his clothes at thrift stores or yard sales. He usually looks like he's on the way to an audition for an episode and leave it to Beaver. <laughs> I've always enjoyed him. He's a pretty hip guy. Anyway, this is called Why I Buy Eight Tracks. Uh, Dwayne wasn't always into eight tracks. He sort of fell into them when he moved to Toronto. He hitchhiked to Toronto three years ago. It took him two weeks. Four days actually moving. The last four days, he spent the first ten days standing opposite the Superstore at, at 12th and Rupert in Vancouver. Dwayne's a huge music fan, and he tried to bring his entire record collection with him. So he's out there with a, with a knapsack and a, and a pile of cardboard boxes taller than he was. Stood there for, for ten days before his girlfriend Cheryl, his ex-girlfriend Cheryl, who was bringing him food twice a day, <laughs> finally told him that she had had enough and if he wanted to leave, he had to leave the records behind him, which he did. And that meant Dwayne arrived here in Toronto with no music, arrived in Toronto with no anything, actually. And then one afternoon, he was at the Salvation Army thrift store looking for smiley face plates. As well as his records, Dwayne left his entire smiley face dinner service behind him in Vancouver. <laughs> And he was finding meals just weren't as happy as they used to be. <laughs> anyway, it was during that visit to the Salvation Army that Dwayne bought his first eight-track tape, The Village People's first album, <laughs> one of his all-time favorite records. Only cost him 25 cents. And you know what? It didn't matter that he couldn't play it. <laughs> Lots of days you don't play records you own. You own a record like The Village People, there are probably more days that you don't play it than days you do. Well, a few weeks later, Dwayne was cruising yard sales, just looking, when he came upon an entire carton of eight tracks. Now, in his former life, he wouldn't have given that carton a second look. However, he was enjoying the village people so much <laughs> that he checked it out, and he just about dropped over dead when he saw a copy of Roxy Music's Avalon for 10 cents. And of course, he bought it. Who wouldn't buy it? Ten cents for a copy of Avalon? He would have had to pay five or ten dollars to get that on vinyl, if he could have found it. Twenty if he wanted to buy it on CD, maybe more. And it was exactly the same music. The next weekend, Dwayne went looking for eight tracks. And he came home with twelve. Cost him a dollar fifty for the dozen. <laughs> he got a KTEL compilation called Dynamite. He got Blood, Sweat, and Tears, he got the first Kiss album, and he got Bat Out of Hell by Meatloaf. <laughs> Within a few weeks, Dwayne had 200 eight-tracks in his basement apartment. And he spent hours trying to work out how to organize them, stacking them on the vertical, then trying the horizontal. Put a lot of thought into which tapes belonged beside which tapes. He still couldn't play them, though, but it didn't seem to matter. Playing them didn't seem to be the point until one night he met a girl at a party who seemed to be interested in everything he was saying. So he was encouraged and he took a chance and he told her about his eight-track collection. And she looked at him like he was crazy and said, isn't that a little like buying gasoline without owning a car? <laughs> she, she'd been talking to him intensely for an hour and as soon as he mentioned eight-tracks, she started looking vaguely around the room and then she drifted away. Something like that can take the wind out of your sails. Especially if that something is a pretty girl, which it was. But it was only a setback. A few weeks later, Dwayne was walking home from another party when he spotted a, a portable stereo on the sidewalk beside a pile of garbage. It was an old Panasonic with detachable speakers, a turntable with a missing tone arm, a radio, and a slot to insert eight track tapes. <laughs> so he lugged it home. And he set it down on the floor beside his mattress, and he plugged it in without even taking off his jacket, and the speakers crackled with dust, and Dwayne just sat there beaming at the static. 
And then he said, what am I doing? And he jumped up and he ran out of the bedroom and he lifted the village people tape off the wall and he raced back into the bedroom and then slowed himself down carefully so he could appreciate the moment and he stuck it into the slot underneath the control knobs and the machine swallowed the tape with a satisfying ka-chunk. And for the first time since he had moved to Toronto, there was music in his life. And he lay back on the floor and he smiled up at the ceiling and fused with the satisfaction of his new sound system and his 478 albums that he had to play (laughs) that had cost him less than $50. So pleased with himself and the music that he didn't notice that the machine was sucking the village people tape out of the plastic cassette box and (laughs) spitting it out onto his bedroom floor like a mound of spaghetti. (laughs) It didn't matter. He just needed a nudge. And finding that machine that night was the nudge he needed. He repaired the village people tape. Took him two nights to figure out how to get the plastic box open. And another evening to wind the tape back onto the spool. Which he did backwards the first time. (laughs) Which wasn't such a bad thing, really. (laughs) Turns out the village people sound just about the same backwards as they do the right way around. Dwayne still has that old Panasonic. He repaired it too, but he has 16 other eight track players now. His favorite, the one he uses the most, is a bright blue plastic orb in the shape of a bowling ball that he got for his 29th birthday. And he owns well over a thousand tapes now. And he's never paid more than a buck for one of them. Most of them, 10 cents each. And he's moved out of the basement apartment. Dwayne moved in with Brian at the beginning of the summer. Brian, who works weekends at the Vinyl Cafe, which is how I got to know Dwayne through Brian. They're a good match, the two of them. Dwayne's eight tracks fit right in with Brian's collection of styrofoam wig heads. (laughs) Every man needs a hobby. And Dwayne wrote this piece that I want to read to you last autumn. He's submitted it to the focus section of the Globe and Mail, but he hasn't heard from them yet. (laughs) This is called Why I Buy 8-Tracks. One, because they're cheap. In less than a year, I've bought over 1,000 albums, and if these were CDs, they would have cost me over 20,000 bucks. My 8-track collection cost me less than 200. Two. Because at that price, I can take chances. At a dime an album, I can try music I'd otherwise not risk. I can afford to make mistakes. Three, because you can only buy them secondhand, looking for eight tracks is like being a prospector, only safer. More than once at yard sales, people have taken me into their homes and led me into their basements and opened a dark cupboard and pointed at a box under a pile of old clothes. It's an adventure. Whoever has an adventure buying a CD? Four, (laughs) this is not a nostalgia thing. It's a political thing. It's like shopping at Goodwill. It feels good to buy something that hasn't been sold to you. (laughs) That's what it says right there. (laughs) I didn't write this. Dwayne wrote this. (laughs) Five, I've never paid GST on an (laughs) 8-track. Six, because eight tracks are the dumbest musical format ever invented. There is no fast forward and sometimes songs are cut right in the middle of a track and you have to wait for them to change tracks to finish the song and the graphics are bad. They're so wrong, they're right. Seven, the sound is better. The wider the tape, the bigger the sound field, the bigger the sound field, the greater the fidelity. Eight, Because when I bought Julia Miller home and she looked at my 8-track collection, she said, any guy who collects 8-tracks must have some good in him. (laughs) Nine, because the tape might break at any time. There's no guarantee it'll come out of your machine in one piece. And so you never know when you might be listening to a tape for the last time. (laughs) And that means you have to appreciate the moment. You have to listen with the attention people gave music before recording devices. Ten, eight tracks are in the vanguard of the coming analog revolution. (laughs) Our mission is to keep analog alive until its ultimate victory over digital, whatever the format. (laughs) 
11. Because a Valiant sedan was the finest car ever made. And you can still find Valiants from the 1970s that are in mint condition. That, that's underlined three times. A green 1972 Valiant with a velvet underground 8-track on the dashboard and a Johnny Cash 8-track in the player would be about the best way to move between any two places. 12. And finally, not convinced? Think about this. You can buy a CD burner for $200. You can buy blank CDs for $2 each. If you buy eight tracks for 10 cents each, which is easy, you could buy 1,000 eight tracks for $100. Now, if you transferred those 1,000 eight tracks onto 1,000 blank CDs, you end up with 1,000 CDs. And those 1,000 CDs will cost you no more than about $2,000, and that's the cost of about 100 CDs in a record store. That means you get 900 CDs for free. Get the picture? <laughs> Thank you.